Squat. I'm your host, Tom Carnes, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, episode 18, The Origins of Mercia. Last episode, we finished up our look at the history of Northumbria, from its creation up to its final fall to the Danes. At the end of last episode, I briefly set out my plan for how this podcast is going to progress in the future, and I explained that my plan is really to focus on the three major kingdoms, so Northumbria, Mercia, and Wessex, and then before going into the reign of Alfred and everything that comes after that, going back and taking a look at the smaller kingdoms like Kent and Essex and East Anglia and, and such, for the main reason that the history of those smaller kingdoms don't really make as much sense if you don't already have a basic understanding of the history of the three major kingdoms, since they pretty much existed entirely in the shadow of those three kingdoms. So now that we've done Northumbria, this episode is the beginning of our look at the history of Mercia, again going from its origins up to its final fall to the Danes. First, let's establish exactly where we're talking about. I know that quite a lot of people listening to this don't live in the UK, so I want to just make it clear roughly where in the UK we're talking about here. Mercia roughly coincides with the Midlands of England. Its original core lay between the rivers Trent and Avon, roughly corresponding to all or part of the modern counties of Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, Warwickshire, the West Midlands and Staffordshire. Over the course of its history, Mercia would expand far beyond these origins, north to the Humber, south to London, west to the border with Wales, and east to the border with East Anglia. In fact, its influence would extend even further, with most Anglo-Saxon kingdoms being subject to Mercian overlordship at some point in their history. Despite this profound influence, though, Mercia's origins are obscure. This isn't unusual in itself. All Anglo-Saxon kingdoms have obscure origins, but Mercia's are particularly obscure, largely because no Mercian accounts of their own origins survive. Everything we have was written by others, chiefly by Bede, and as we've discussed and will discuss further, these accounts were not very favourable to the Mercians, to put it nicely. The sense that Mercia was defined mainly in its opposition to others is inescapable, even if it is frustrating. The name Mercia reflects the kingdom's origins between other more well-established peoples. It derives from Mercia, an old English word meaning border or march, thus identifying the Mercians as a border people. From the historical record, it's easy to see why. Mercia was the last of the major Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to emerge onto the historical stage. The first definitely historical king of Mercia was Penda, who became king in 626. By this time, all the other kingdoms had definitely emerged from the mists of legend and successfully consolidated their own distinct identities. So it's no wonder, really, that this new kingdom was understood in contrast to these already established identities and geographic borders. The delay, for lack of a better word, in the emergence of Mercia can be partly explained by the fact that its heartlands in the English Midlands were basically as far away from the ocean as you can get in the UK before you start heading back towards the ocean again. The Adventus Saxonum was a naval migration, thus the first settlements and kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxons originated on the coasts. The Midlands, by comparison, were not occupied by Germanic settlers until later, thus they consolidated their identities and their political power structures later, and existed for a time as the weaker neighbour on the edge of pre-existing and more powerful kingdoms. So, this naturally raises the question, what happened before 626, and when did the Mercians establish their kingdom, and how? According to legends preserved in royal genealogies, and in the Life of St. Guthlac of Crowland, written by Felix in the mid-8th century, the founder of the Mercian dynasty was a warrior king named Ichel a descendant of Woden via Offa of Angel, a legendary figure in both Old English and Old Norse tradition. From Ichel, the kings of Mercia became known as Ichelingas, 
according to traditions recorded in the 13th and 14th centuries at St Albans Abbey in Hertfordshire, this Ichel was the king who led the Angles across the North Sea in the early 500s, and who established his rule over what would become East Anglia and Mercia, driving out the Britons from those regions. This is all legendary though, and presents an image of Mercia as unified into a single kingdom from the very beginning, something that is not unusual in classical and medieval origin myths, but which has little to do with how kingdoms and ethnic identities actually emerge. One part of the Ichel story that is certainly true, or at least echoes truth, is that the ancestors of the Mercians did spread into the British Midlands from East Anglia. Movement mainly followed the rivers, and displays a clear migration westward in the 5th century. In the east, in Leicestershire, at the confluence of the rivers Saw and Reek, we see Germanic settlement in the mid-5th century. By the late 5th century, settlers had moved west, reaching the Avon Valley in Warwickshire. This seems to have just been the first wave of migration inland. Germanic settlement, or at least cultural dominance, in the Midlands begins in earnest in the 6th century suggesting further migration and further contact between the Britons and the settlers. The archaeology of early grave sites and settlements indicate that the Anglian peoples settling in these regions wore clothes and jewellery following patterns seen at that same time in East Anglia. This dominance of East Anglian culture only lasted for a short time though, before other styles, mainly from Wessex, began to spread into the young Anglian communities from the Thames Valley. The largest concentration of burials in the Mercian heartland occur in the Avon Valley in Warwickshire, at places like Stretton-on-Foss, Wasperton and Alverston Manor. The three sites just named offer up interesting evidence for the nature of Germanic settlement in the Mercian heartlands in the 6th century. At Alverston Manor, for example, the majority of graves are those of men buried with weapons, a fact that has been used by some writers to argue for a military takeover by a warrior elite. Contrasting with this, though, the sites at Stretton-on-Foss and Wasperton yield up evidence for continuity between Romano-British and Anglian settlements from the late 5th to the 6th centuries. At these sites, we find clear evidence of coexistence between Britons and Anglians. For example, graves of men and women dressed in Anglian garb but buried with British textiles, or in graves constructed with British practices, such as lining with charcoal, the construction of cysts from stone slabs, or decapitation of the deceased. At both sites, the Anglian and the British graves cluster into separate groups, indicating some distinction between the two communities. Also at Wasperton, we find evidence of cremation, a practice not used by the Britons, or for that matter, by the Anglians at Stratton-on-Foss. On the whole, there is more evidence for coexistence between Britons and Anglians than there is for open conflict. Possibly this may be because none of the people in this region were especially wealthy. There are grave goods, certainly, but nothing on the scale of the princely burials we see taking place at Sutton Hoo in East Anglia, or at Pritterwell in Essex at this same time. Other things that these burials indicate is that there was seemingly no one homogenous identity among the settlers. They were all broadly Anglian, but the customs at all these different sites differ in some marked ways. For example, the practice of cremation at Wasperton in contrast with its absence at Stretton-on-Foss. Further north in the Peak District of Derbyshire, we find burials that are even more unusual when compared to those seen in the Avon Valley. There we find a tradition of barrow burials, in which a local warrior elite, wealthy but not on the scale of a Sutton Hoo or a Prittlewell, asserted their power through lavish burials, like the one found at Benty Grange, near Muniash. From this, we can speculate that there was no single Mercian identity among these earliest settlers. Rather, smaller tribal identities were probably dominant. This supposition can be supported with a document from the 8th century called the Tribal Hydage. This document contains a list of the various peoples who lived in England south of the Humber, with the number of hides that comprise their territory listed, as well as their names. The list begins with the area first called Mercia, and from there proceeds to wind a snake-like path through the various tribes and petty kingdoms of Midland and Southern England, culminating in Wessex, including groups like the Pexetan of Derbyshire and the Whitcher of Gloucestershire. One feature of the names that have stood out to scholars 
is the location of those groups whose names contain the element Setan, all of which are located to the west and northwest of Mercia, in territory previously controlled by Britons, following the Saxon migrations inland. Since Setan is an unusual word, without a clear meaning in Old English, it has been suggested that these groups were of the hybrid Anglo-British type found in some archaeological sites like Wasperton and Stretton-on-Foss. What emerges, then, is exactly the kind of fragmented jigsaw of tribal groups that the diversity of burial practices in Mercia suggests. No one is entirely sure why the tribal hideage was created. The prevailing theory is that it's a tribute list, but whose tribute list is the main question? The consensus leans towards it being Mercian, probably compiled during a period of Mercian supremacy. The kings Wolfhera and Offa are sometimes suggested. Some scholars, though, suggest that it was created by King Oswiu following his victory over Penda and his subsequent overlordship of Mercia. Regardless of its purpose, though, the Hydage is a key document for the early cultural makeup of Anglo Saxon England in general and Mercia in particular. Let's summarise what all this evidence suggests. Mercia began in the heartlands defined by the Trent and the Avon, and from there expanded to absorb countless smaller tribes and communities until Finally, they became entirely Mercian. The majority of these groups vanished without a trace, and are only recorded now in the tribal Hydage, and that's not counting the ones who disappeared before the Hydage was created. Other groups, like the Witcher, managed to maintain their independence long enough to leave behind some kind of written records, but in the end, they too became Mercian. So the early history of Mercia is probably not the history of one kingdom but instead it is the history of the rise of one tribal group to overlordship of all others. Thus the story of Ichel probably reflects the origin myths of that particular tribe, or collection of tribes, and was used to reflect later Mercian identity back into the distant past. Hi, I hope you don't mind me inserting a little plug here in the middle, but I just wanted to say that I very much appreciate everyone who listens to this show, and I'm just completely overwhelmed by how positive the response to it's been. If you enjoyed the show and want to help it get more exposure and want to help it keep going, then if you could please subscribe or leave a rating or a review or a like or whatever the system is on your particular podcast app, that'd be very much appreciated. Also, we now have a Facebook page anglo-saxon england podcast on facebook and a youtube channel if you like consuming your podcasts that way we also have just started a patreon which will give you certain benefits if you pledge a certain amount a month as a way to help keep the show going help offset the costs of producing it and to help make sure that it stays free in its entirety so if you could do any of that be very much appreciated if you can't that's also fine and i'm very very grateful that you're listening so now i will leave you and get back to the episode despite its fragmented origins by 626 when penda emerges onto the scene some kind of mercian identity had come into existence but exactly how we got from the disparate anglian and anglo-british tribes to the Kingdom of Mercia isn't clear. Some possible evidence does survive in two references we have to Mercian kings pre-Penda, but exactly what we should make of these is not entirely clear. The most complete information comes from the genealogy of King Ethelred of Mercia, preserved in the so-called Anglian Register of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. This genealogy records his ancestry going back to Woden via Ichel. One name on this list in particular attracted the attention of 13th century historians. Creoda, or Critta, it's spelt in different ways, was the father of Pibba, father of Penda. Later writers took this name and references in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to a probably equally legendary West Saxon named Creoda who died in 534, to weave a speculative history of Creoda, grandson of Ichel, as the first king of Mercia. This almost certainly is not a genuine historical tradition, 
and was created from the imagination of 13th century historians trying to explain where this kingdom of Mercia that they were reading about came from. Probably the best way we can point out that it's not a genuine historical tradition is that if it was, then surely a source like the life of Guthlach would presumably have mentioned it. In fact, the life of Guthlach doesn't say anything about Creoda, and the founder of the Mercian dynasty and the Mercian kingdom is Ichel. So we can pretty definitely discard the legend of Creoda as ahistorical. The second putative pre-Pender king of Mercia is a bit more complicated. He is referred to by Bede. If you'll recall, uh, back in the episode on Edwin of Northumbria, Bede tells us that while Edwin was in exile, he married a woman by the name of Quenba, who was daughter of King Cheol of Mercia. The story of Cheol is somewhat more compelling than the legend of Creoda, since he definitely has a connection to a real historical figure in Edwin. But what is puzzling is that Cheol doesn't appear in any of the Mercian royal genealogies. Some have suggested that he possibly was not a real person, since his name, Cheol, is the Old English word for a commoner, and thus may have been a joke at his expense. This seems unlikely, though, since it would have been out of character for Bede, whose history is otherwise entirely serious, and Cheol was an ally of Edwin, and thus would have been in Bede's good graces. So why make a joke belittling him? It's most likely, then, that Cheol was actually his name. But why, then, is he not included in any royal genealogies? There are two possible explanations. One is that he was a ruler of a kingdom that was absorbed into Mercia, rather than Mercia itself. Another is that he was from a separate and possibly rival dynasty to that which produced Pender. Regardless of which of these explanations we prefer, the consensus is that his family was not the one that ruled Mercia when it entered the historical record under Pender. One explanation for this is that Cheol may have suffered some kind of catastrophe between marrying his daughter to Edwin in the 610s and the emergence of Pender in the 620s. Nicholas Hyam suggests that this catastrophe came at the hands of Athelfrith of Northumbria, the man who drove Edwin into exile to begin with. Specifically, Hyam points to the 616 Battle of Chester, at which Athelfrith massacred British soldiers and monks. Given the close links between Mercia and the Britons, as attested by things like the archaeology, in names like Pibba and Pender, and in Pender's close alliance with Cadwathlon of Gwynedd, Hyam suggests that Cheol was also involved in the Battle of Chester, and was either killed or subjugated, at which point Mercia came under Northumbrian overlordship, and Edwin was forced to flee to East Anglia. It has to be stressed, though, that this is speculative. It's based solely on the one reference in Bede, historical links between Mercia and the Britons, and the fact that Cheol was no longer king by 626. It's entirely possible that the Battle of Chester had nothing to do with it, and that Cheol was just the first king to fall before Pender's military prowess. Regardless of what happened to Cheol, his death or disappearance or whatever, takes us up to the point where Mercia definitely existed in some form, and began flexing its muscles. As we've discussed in this episode, the origins of Mercia are hazy. It began as a migration inland by Anglian settlers, who sailed down the rivers which cut deep into the heart of England. There they established their own communities, or settled among the Britons who had long lived there. The result was a complex tapestry of small tribes and petty kingdoms, which gradually came to engage with their neighbouring communities as a single entity called Mercia. This consolidation probably occurred through a mix of violence and peaceful intermingling, but the political world of early Mercia must have been a seething hotbed of potential overlords. In this light, what is most remarkable about Pender is not just that he became the clear king of Mercia, but that he succeeded in establishing a dynasty with enough energy and prestige to keep control of Mercia for over a century, while also expanding their supremacy over much older and much more powerful kingdoms.
Despite being, or perhaps because it was the youngest of all major Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Mercia was not only able to erupt onto the stage in a way no other kingdom had, but it was also able to parlay this initial energy into long-lasting power structures that withstood the rising and falling of its fortunes for well over 200 years. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I have been your host, Tom Kearns, and next episode, we will be looking at the life and times of King Penda and the first stage of Mercian supremacy. <laughs>